I think it's important to have protection plans, as I mm. said, right? Because if we do not have enough savings today, at least we know that when we get into unexpected situations, dipping into your savings is not the way to go. At least we know that, you know, having a protection plan will give us that confidence that we do have, um, you know, our insurer to hopefully help us pay for our hospitalization bill, you and know, cancer treatment. Hopefully not very confident, but... eh, right? Hopefully not yes, very confident. Yes, they will, right? Dep- better pay, better pay right? Out, right? If, not, if they don't pay, you come on the show, we will blackmail yeah. them. <laughs> I'm going to say a little bit more. Introduce yourself. Hello, morning. I'm Adriana. I'm looking after consumer experience and research at Sing Life. Maybe to start off, right, I'm curious, like, are you financially free? Well, you see, financial freedom, financially free, right? It really depends on my life stage, needs and aspirations. Mm. As a working mom, I have three school kids. They're not too young. Three. Three, but three. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> One is like doing her PSLE, 12, 16 and 19. They're still schooling. Means that, you know, I need to provide them quality education, right? Mm. So financially free to me is the ability to provide them a quality education. Mm. So if today, yeah, all three tell me that they want to go overseas to study, I need to be able to provide that. However not incurring too much debt. So Mm. that to me defines financially freedom, right? To be able to provide them quality education without incurring debts. And again, in my 40s now, financially free... <laughs> don't need to free, say one, your 30s when it's fine. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. But 40s, <laughs> right, right, right? You know, my timeline... <laughs> my timeline to retirement is like nearer and nearer. Right? Because in Singapore, the average age of retirement is around 62, 63. Mm. So my timeline is getting shorter, right? So again, to me, financial freedom is about not having too much debts, right? I'm still paying my housing mortgage. So to me, financially free is able to retire, have a desired lifestyle, still being able to travel and not having too much expenses. So on those parameters, you are financially free. Is that what I'm hearing? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Somewhat, right? So where so, are you missing? Like, what, what do you think? A little <laughs> bit more, then I'll be financially free. I definitely need that little bit more, right? Uh, the little uh, bit more means what? I need to not have my mortgage, not paying for my car loans. And of course, having that stability in income. You know, Singapore, we hear retrenchment. You know, there's rising inflation. Today, I heard on radio that transport is going to increase yes. by about 10 cents right from December like hey you know that will have an impact on financial freedom today I feel that hey yeah I'm somewhere there but tomorrow when I hear something oh my god I need to like take a step back are you sure mm-hmm. right so that will really have a you know <laughs> impact on my financial freedom definitely yeah yeah no but I think what you just described is about how you feel about it right which is a big tenet to the paper that you did, right? Yeah. Or the survey that you guys did because that was the thing that I, I saw. I mean, every day people send me media release. Oh yeah, we did this survey. We did yeah. that. Yeah. Every day I see this thing. But in your survey, it was very clear that it was a feel. Exactly. Right? So, and I think that's the interesting element. Maybe you can share with us a little bit more. Like what does it mean to feel financially free? <laughs> Financial freedom is so personal, it's so Mm. subjective. And we do want to have a formula, right? It's just getting too complicated. And and it's not just about numbers. It's about having that peace of mind. Mm. And we believe that, you know, we we don't want to be like a teacher telling people what to do, right? But we want to understand how they feel Mm. about understanding their financial attitudes, perceptions, behavior, right? Mm. So, I mean, this study is all about understanding how people feel towards their financial freedom. And doing this across like, many Singaporeans, right? We did like 3,000. That is a big sample Mm, size, mm. right? So understanding that financial freedom, how they feel, allow us to understand, hey, what is Singaporeans feeling today towards their financial freedom? And what are they thinking about the financial behavior, Mm. their habits, their perception, right? So to give an idea in terms of the kind of product or solution that we can offer to them, Mm. right? Obviously, it needs to be catered to their needs, their lifestyle. And we want to ensure that we do have such solution that meets their lifestyle, their needs. You want to be the provider. Either. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't want to just tell them, hey, you need to have yeah, like, this protection this, uh... plan. You need to have that personal accident plan. Like, <laughs> well, no, I, I sense it... the mama on this <laughs> Exactly, right? You don't want to be telling, right? Not like, yeah. No, I think that is enough. It's very stressful. So we just want to ask, understand the feeling a little bit more relaxed, right? Mm, it's not about mm. formula. Well, yes, we still need to set aside a certain proportion of our savings to retirement, but we don't want to tell them to be, be so strict. So mm. understand that feeling, right? Mm. It's so important. As I said, it's not just about numbers, yeah. right? Yeah. To yeah. me, it's so important to have that peace of mind. And 
I think that is a, a big part of why people do this whole personal finance, you know, element of it. It's not just about being massively wealthy. Objectively, a lot of people can look at their career choices and look at their way of life and know that I will never be very, very filthy rich. Like, exactly. Right? Because you, you can count out, right? You yeah. know, <laughs> you're 30 years your career pick, you can aga count, right? If you want to do the massive growth, then you go and do your business, you know, investing, all those kind of things, right? Which I think we also cover a lot of this channel. Exactly. But a big swath of people just want to feel safe. Exactly. They want to feel financially free. Exactly. Yeah. To be assured, right? Yeah. To have the confidence that I feel that my retirement will be okay doing the things that I want to do. I probably enjoy, you know, during yeah. retirement, right? So it's that feeling state, yes, right? Yes. And it really differs from people to people. Yeah. So so as with all Singaporeans, right, we love to gossip about other people, right? So <laughs> <laughs> totally Singaporeans right. like to compare, right? So in your survey amongst the 3,000 people, you know, uh, where are we looking at? Like, in terms of how many people are feeling financially free and then how do you kind of label the others that are not financially free? Yeah, I think that's a super interesting question, right? So in the survey, right, I mean, there are many, many questions. It was super comprehensive, right? So we started off this single question, how financially free do you feel currently today? So it was asked on a scale of 1 to 10, mm. right? So people who rated themselves 8, nine or ten or maybe I'll ask you how will you rate yourself today I think I'm at a seven seven uh, yeah, ah, I'm in the ballpark okay. somewhere there but now of course business are very headache right exactly so, <laughs> so, yes yes if I retire from this I will feel like an eight uh. right yeah yeah so, so <laughs> if you have rated yourself an eight right yeah. so people who rated themselves eight nine or ten we term them as the financially free consumers right okay. and if I look at the survey finding that represents around 29% of the 3,000 people that mm. we spoke to financially free. But just now you said seven, right? Yeah. So you are actually on par with the majority of Singaporeans, Thank you. Thank right? You. So <laughs> you are actually the 54% of the 3,000 people that we spoke to. They rated themselves between four to seven. So people basically, they rated four, five, six or seven on that scale, right? That I talk about. So we call them everyday consumer yeah. because you are just like, the masses. I'm just the mess, yes. You're the masses, I'm not special. Right? So aren't you? You're not oh. special too. <laughs> so, but you know how yeah. we get to eight, yeah? yeah. So that remaining group that I didn't talk about, um, they effectively rated themselves one, two mm. or three, right? Mm. So you can imagine on a scale of 10, one to three, it's on the lower side. Mm. So we term them as the financially constrained. Mm. So this financially constrained group. Very positive, group, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the terminology. Very financially positive. Constrained. Constrained. Yes, constrained. Yes. Well, they are constrained. Doesn't mm. mean that it's a very bad thing. Mm. It's just that when they do think the word constrained means that they do have some limitation. Mm. They do have some concerns. They need to rethink. Probably not overspending because they are constrained by something. Mm. And obviously in this case, constrained by their finances. Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair. To be clear, right? So you begin this survey by evaluating how the individual feels. Mm. Right? Mm. It's not about how much money they have, you know, all that. It, it just yet. starts with, yes. okay, how do they feel? Yeah. So we started the survey with asking them, like, how do they feel? But of course, the survey is not just that one question, course, right? right? Then how do you know. come on the show? You only got exactly, one question. right. <laughs> no insights to share. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So to be able to understand why do they rate themselves, like, for you, seven, six, we went on to ask them, like, many, many questions, right? So in fact, we went on to ask them, um, you know, there was, like, six teams that... Um, could affect or influence their financial freedom. So these six themes include things like retirement, managing recurring expenses, managing unexpected events, saving and uh, investment, or even contributing back to the society, right? And across these six themes, there were a total about 25 attributes that we asked them, right? So these 25 attributes um, really have questions on helping us understand what is the state of financial situation, their attitude. So just to give you a flavor, out of the 25 questions, there was this question that we asked them, okay, do you feel confident on your ability to retire yeah, anytime that you want? Okay. You rate yourself 1 to 10, mm. right? You, some will say 5, 6 and all that. Yeah. Another question, right? Oh, are you able to manage your recurring expenses? Or are you able to pay your loan most mm. of the time, right? Mm. So these teams across the six teams, right? So we allow us to understand the financial attitudes and perceptions. And this is again, attitude pays because again, it talks about how confident yeah. on your ability. Yeah. However, we also ask them things like, oh, how much do you need? Do mm. you think you need? You think, you believe, right? Mm. Um, you know, you need to feel financially free. How much are you saving? What kind of financial products they have? So why we need to understand this is because it gives us an understanding, right? Why 
a consumer could have rated themselves a 1 versus why a consumer will rate themselves a 9 or 10 because it really depends on the type of saving or investments or the kind of portfolio or your attitudes or your version or your vision of financial freedom. Mm, yeah. Mm. Fair, fair. And I think that was one of the interesting part of the report that I saw, right? Which I want to be sure. So I wrote it down, yeah? <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah, I'm very clear about this. The financially constrained, right? In the report, it suggests that the financially constrained feels that the median amount needed to feel financially free is 650,000 whereas the financially free only feels that they need 540,000 to feel financially free and this double down on the idea that I've been peddling for a long time that a lot of people are actually up blowing the number in their head right especially for people that come from the ground right like not a great family ground mm. up type of individuals you make money already you still feel afraid right it's like not enough not enough yeah. right and objectively in your mind you need a hundred thousand more than a guy that is already financially free to feel financially free exactly it's quite an interesting observation yeah it is yeah. right so yeah I mean everybody will have their own interpretation of yeah. how much they believe yeah believe yeah. I'm sure they're not calculating because I can't imagine a lot of Singaporeans will be that financially savvy, right? Mm. So we want to understand how much they believe they need to feel financially free during yeah. their retirement. And you mentioned, right, the numbers. So in fact, the median amount, right, again, 3,000 people, right? We yeah. don't want to take the average because if you take the average, someone would say, I need 10 million. Someone <laughs> would say they need like, anybody, only 10,000. Did anybody say that in your data set? Totally no. All right, we are totally outliers. We'll circle right? that as an anomaly. <laughs> we, yeah, we'll put everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. So the average will be skewed by such people who give mm. a very big amount because that's what they believe. And maybe why they need that, maybe they believe that they need to take um, you know, a private jet for, mm. for their holiday. Hence, they believe they need 10 million. 650,000, very hard to have private jet. La. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, you see, yeah. calling, yeah. guys, right? Yeah, <laughs> tough, yeah, very tough, very yeah. hard. Yeah, so we yeah. took the median amount, right? Mm, which mm. is around 500 plus, 566,000, mm, right? Mm, so that mm. is the median amount they feel they need to feel financially yeah, yeah, free. Yeah during retirement. Yeah, and and, that, and exactly right. The, the survey anchors on this few things which I want to accentuate, right? If you feel like you're struggling, right? Actually, objectively, you may not be. Exactly. Right? Objectively, exactly. because the data shows or this survey shows that a lot of people that are financially constrained are outblowing the numbers in their head. Maybe you just do an objective recount of like how much do you really need, you know, exactly. like all that stuff which we have talked about in many other episodes. Then you will feel more comfortable. Like actually, one month, I only need to spend like 3,000, you know, exactly. that I don't really need so much. You at least have some clarity in your goals, which mm -hmm. then gives you that comfort and you don't feel so stressed out over it. La. Exactly. I think everybody is looking for that security, that buffer, right? Yes. It's all about that mindset, right? Yes. As I said earlier, it's also about that peace of mind, yeah. right? So what amount will be able to give me that peace of mind? So yes. hence, sometimes we can't avoid having that little buffer because again, it's feeling. Otherwise, we would have to speak to our financial advisor who is probably a little bit more mathematical, right? Mm, looking mm. at your expenses, looking at your lifestyle. It's quite invasive uh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You yeah. must build the trust and you and must trust yourself easy. also. Yes, it's not easy. It's not easy. We sit down with enough financial advisor who are very invasive. Yeah. Uh. yeah. How much you have? How much you spend? Like that. Like. Like, oh my God, why <laughs> do I need to tell you? <laughs> why should I tell you? Right? So having that belief, so at least it gives us a goal, mm, right? Mm. But I think we have to uh, you know, be realistic about that goal as well, right? So again, if I feel I need 566,000, that's the medium round, right? I think then... I need to plan, right? I, mm. I can't like just believe that I need and I don't do anything about it. Mm. So I think having that discipline of savings, having that discipline of planning, ensuring that our financial portfolio is well balanced, meaning, mm. you know, have adequate savings, have some protection plans, right? Because protection plans are so important. Like today, if something happens to me, touch wood, yeah. It's wood, right? It's not wood, it's glass, oh, not wood. by the okay, way. Okay, fine, touch glass. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That if I don't have a protection plan, if I get into a critical illness, I can't work. Like, oh my God, what happened to my three kids, mm, right? Mm. So even if today, the financially constrained, right? If they find it like, hard to save I think at the bare minimum they need to have at least some protection plan because mm. this will help them to protect them right against such unfortunate unexpected mm. events mm. right for the mm. illness or you know some hospitalization plan as well right mm. Um, mm. but of course it all boils down to what I need and having that discipline and commitment to commit that amount to save and to reach the goal that I believe I need Mm. during my retirement to feel financially free. To feel. The word is feel. Feel, right? Feel, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So in another part of your survey, you all also talk about, I don't have exact data, but 
But sure. this is a definitive line that you put on your survey, right? To say that, you know, uh, amongst the top insurance, uh, life insurance is the top insurance owned by people across all the segments, right? And mm. I thought it was like, really? Right? Like quite interesting. And I, I want to ask, like, maybe from a survey data standpoint, right? Are these 3,000 people self-select? Are they from your community? Uh, How do you get those people? I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, is this a skilled information? Like, everybody has life insurance. That's their biggest thing, you know? So, yeah, where, where do you get these 3,000 people? Super important question, right? So, yeah. I think exactly. We definitely, firstly, don't want to re, uh, misrepresent any data points, yeah. right? And hence, that also have the starting point of we want to go to 3,000, at least 3,000, right? Yeah. Because having a big sample size, right, allow us to, Mitigate some of these you know, things, yeah. right? It's a robust sample size. Mm. I can stand by my numbers, right? Mm. You're a bit stat savvy, right? You know, 3,000, the the margin yeah. of error is so tiny. It's very tiny. It's thousand, very tiny. Uh, actually, a thousand, a thousand is already, is really very good good enough, already. Right? The plus yes. minus three yes, percent, yes, right? Yes. So not just the three thousand to ensure that it's a very robust sample size. Uh, we ensure that it's not skewed to a particular group. Mm. Meaning, uh, okay, la, male, right, more savvy, right? We only yeah. interview the males uh, now. Or uh, maybe the 35 to 45, right? Who are probably a little bit more savvy as well. We only interview them. No, right? So to ensure that there's no bias in terms of um, selection, we set quotas. Uh, what do I mean, quotas, right? For instance, if today Singapore, right, agarration, yeah? 50% males, 50% females in Singapore population. So in our survey, we went to ensure that we have at least 50% females, 50% okay. males. And we said the same thing on age, 18 to 24, 25 to 39. We, we ensure that this represents the Singapore population, right? Mm. So we set quotas by age, gender, household income. Household income is an important variable as well because you can argue that, okay, maybe the more affluent folks could afford buying insurance plans and they mm. probably will have a lot more insurance plan than, than the not so financially um, you know healthy ones right but no so we have to ensure that we covered all groups yeah. so basically covered all segments of people in Singapore so no selection bias mm. big sample size to ensure yeah. that it's sound and we work with a partner actually right so it's so there's a third party there's a third randomness party vendor it. randomness okay. we did okay. not pick we did not just speak to our customers because if I talk to my own community right they are a self-select exactly. there is a bias to this already exactly. the data is skewed okay so there's a third party, there's ran a third party random statistics of here to this correct so it's very important oh, we're getting very technical in this oh, huh? yeah God. not bad ah, <laughs> right. so, yeah okay okay approve approve yes yeah, yes yeah, yes yeah. so yeah third party is important as well so we ensure that we do not just speak to our customers yes. and one important approach is it's a blinded survey we do not say like hey sing live commission this survey <laughs> and you need to be saying that hey you know you're, you're not having this not having that you feel good and feel bad mm, no right mm. it's a blinded survey it's representative right we did not choose to to, you know, interview who or you know, whether if you are, you know, a little bit rich or, you know, poor, it's not important, right? We just want a voice mm. from the Singapore consumers and that really help us understand, you know, the findings in a more non-biased manner. But it's interesting because life insurance is very expensive. In the 3,000 people that you've surveyed, they all have it, right? Or, or across the board, that is forms the top three insurance that they all have. So that is the first, like the biggest thing that they own. Yeah, I think it, that is also probably not too surprising because mm. I think... Is it by the size? Is it by the premium size? How, how are you evaluating this? Oh, okay. This? So, so it was a simple question, right? Because, yeah. you know, we don't want to be too technical. These yeah. are your normal consumers, right? Okay. So we basically okay, ask okay, them. Normal consumers. Yeah, yeah. adjust a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they, they're not so technical. Yeah, like, like, yeah like, they won't know the policies that they, they have, pay? right? Yeah, how much they pay. Yeah, yeah, if you ask how much me, they pay, maybe they know. Like, maybe not offhand yeah, as a survey. Like, but will okay. you remember like, how much yeah, you pay yeah, for no, your premiums? I myself wouldn't remember. Exactly, right? So we basically ask them, okay, we show them a list. Out of all these type of insurance, just tell me what are the types of insurance that you are actually owning. So they can pick life insurance, health insurance, critical illness insurance, um, or maybe some of the general insurance like your car insurance, home insurance, right? So mm. yeah, it did come out that life insurance is number one. And we did not purposely put life insurance at the top, yeah? Yeah. Right? So like they commonly <laughs> just skew, pick, uh, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so okay. important, right? Okay. We make sure that, you know, the answer options are randomized, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So sometimes for you, maybe you see life insurance on top, maybe for another person, life insurance in the middle, right? So it was randomized in a way that, oh, that again, is quite cool. yeah. it's not by that you do manage, not pick yes. the top three products mm, that you mm, see, mm, right? Mm. I think life insurance is something that Singaporeans know, right? And perhaps, you know, financial advisors, right, in Singapore are definitely doing a good job, right? Yeah. In terms of advising their customers, in terms of what they should have given your financial status. If we have only a certain amount of money, then we probably need to start with life insurance, perhaps. And that's mm. why, you know, many we do see more people having life insurance. 
Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. Yeah. And then on the internet, there's a debate, right? Between term life and whole life, right? So like, what is your stand on this thing? Like, is it whole life or is it term life? What do you do with this? You see, again, normal consumer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by term life? Yeah, yeah. Whole life. No, but our life network what? understand one. Our network understand <laughs> one. So, so yeah, what, maybe you can help us understand a little bit. What's the difference? You know, and do you have a personal position on like how, do, which one will you go for? And maybe, yeah, for somebody that's like 35, working class, professional, yeah. you know, maybe like your colleague, maybe your junior colleague lah. You know, some, some, you know, 30 plus like that, yeah. Yeah, again, right, there's no right or wrong, right? It really depends on your own financial status, mm. yeah, on what you want. Whole life, term life for me, um, well, I have whole life, right? Because mm. I think at the state when I purchase my whole life, it's probably more suitable for me. It gave me, again, that sense of security. I, I feel, right, a little bit more secure in whole life. So at least I know that my dependents, if I pass, they will be okay, Right, they won't struggle. So question on that, right? Do you get whole life after you have dependence? Ah, that's a good question, right? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. You are right. Ah. So that was probably one consideration factor. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think when I was single, ayah. Ayah. Ayah, right? It's about party today or tomorrow. Exactly, uh. <laughs> right? Whole life, term it's life. It's a small life, mate. Again, touch yeah, glass, touch yeah, yeah. food, right? It's okay, right? Yes, I, yes, I don't really yes. have to worry too yes, much. Yes. But once, when I started having my first kid, that's where you start to rethink. Mm. You start to relook. You start to review your mm. financial portfolio, yeah. right? What do you have? Or what do you need to have? what is the trajectory, right, for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Mm. And our needs, our wants change along yeah. the way and we adapt. So you're right. I probably had a review after I had my first kid, right, to mm. really review and seriously think. Not to say that I wasn't serious, but once you have a first kid, you... I think the seriousness is different one. It's, it's another level, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, yes. We have to be really serious in understanding what we really need mm. and to ensure that our dependents are well taken care of. Yeah. So at that stage... That was many years ago. I'm not going to say how many years. It's going to no, review it's fine, my it's age. Fine, it's fine. Yeah. It's so fine. then, yeah. So you're right. Um, after my first kid, I, I felt that whole life um, insurance was definitely um, more suitable for me. So yeah. it gave me that peace of mind, and security, and comfort that okay. hey, you know, they'll be well protected. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair. And I want to add to our audience, right? Recently, my partner's mom passed on, right? And in that process, she closed her own life insurance to keep my partner's life insurance. Wow. Okay, so that is to me a no-no, right? It sounds very good as a mom, right? Because that's an emotional, you you don't want to jeopardize your kid, blah, 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 right? So because you cannot afford to pay already, right? Because of the COVID, everything, right? Yeah. So you terminate your own life insurance, but you keep your child's insurance alive because of this idea of protection. Mm. But the reality, I want to put it out there, right? Is that if there is a choice, it comes to a choice between keeping your kid's life insurance and your life insurance, you better keep your life insurance because yeah. it is built upon your life. You are the parameter of it. Correct. Right? Exactly. That means uh, likelihood is you will pass on first. La. Yes. <laughs> In all odds, In right? In all odds, uh, yes. likelihood you pass on first and yes. the insurance kicks off when you move on. Right? Yes. So that is the idea. Please do not you know, do the whole like close your insurance because you want to protect your kid. It's protection is quite iffy, but technically, this is uh, my stance. Uh, is, is it a fair stance? Well, if again, you get into such a situation. Yeah, you see, as outsiders, we may not know that specific personal circumstances. Of course, of course, right? of course. So maybe to, you know, for that particular individual, maybe it makes sense. But of course, I think it's always better to speak to someone who is more professional. Because oh, again, very professional, as, has, yes. as, as consumers, we wouldn't know. It's so technical, right? Yeah. What is the difference? And do I need to surrender, right? Right? Or, yeah. or close my insurance policy, I, I, I wouldn't be able to know. And um, being emotional, I, I probably will make a wrong decision. So mm. I always feel it's important to speak to someone, someone who is a little bit uh, more professional, who have a lot of experience to be able to advise you. I think that is important. But ultimately, yeah. you make your decision. And the decision that you make needs to be a little bit on your own personal circumstances, also thinking about your dependence. Mm. Right? Fair, yeah. fair, fair. But that is my position. Huh? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> that is my position. But yes, <laughs> I think back onto the survey that is why you're on the show right? What is the difference uh, between the financially free and everyday consumer? What, what have you observed? Well, you know the financially free, right? Going back to the definition. Yeah. Okay, what's the definition? People who rated themselves 8, 9 and 10 on the scale of 1 to 10. So these people across 
all the questions that we ask, right? You know, whether if they are, you know, having the choice to retire anytime they want, whether they start the planning for retirement, how much they are saving retirement. We do see, obviously, a higher score. The scores mm. are way like, significant, one, right? Yeah. But they are very confident. Uh, and zone, hence, yeah. they are like 8, 9 or 10, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. to give you a perspective, I think on average, right, across the 25 um, attributes that we ask, right, again, across the six teams, retirement, recurring expenses, and all that, on average, it's about 60 to 70 percent of them will have the confidence to say that they can retire anytime they would have planned for their retirement they know how much they need for retirement they are able to pay back their loans they are able to support their dependents around 60 to 70 percent across all the attributes that's quite good right that's super for good for Singaporeans hey that's shout out good. to y'all I'm not working hard. exactly yeah, right it's yeah. a very high score but of course if you compare to the other group scores are definitely much lower around it ranges right between the 30 to 50s so immediately you already see that difference right from a 60 to 70s on average across all the 25 attributes to a 30 to 50s on average across all the attributes. So right? this difference between financially free and the everyday consumer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you can imagine, right, the financially mm. constrained, that number, again, mm. there will be up and downs, right? Yeah. That's yeah. even way lower, 10 to 20%. Because you see, they are feeling a little bit this uh, uncomfortable, right, in terms of their ability to cope with the everyday. And for such group of consumers, right, especially financially constrained, we do see that actually only like um, less than 30% have even started planning for retirement. And we know why, I right? Mean, you it's... cannot settle day to day how to plan. Exactly, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so less than 30 have even started planning or yeah. thinking about retirement yeah, 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 yeah. versus the financially free where, yeah. you know, the 60s or 70% have already started planning for retirement. So that's the big gap that we do see So how do we go survey. from the everyday consumer to the financially free? Do you all try to understand this in your survey? Like what is the divergence other than just their personal recount? Yeah, I mean, you see, it's not just about numbers, right? Of course, I think it is possible, but it's not like immediately, right? Yeah. I mean, financial freedom is not an uh, overnight journey. We definitely do need planning. I, I think first, um, we do see a difference in terms of um, the, the vision that they have towards financial um, you know, freedom or the kind of retirement they envision to have. I think firstly, how to move up is, well, it's definitely possible, but we need planning. So mm. a very disciplined approach. So we need to definitely set aside small amount, big amount, whatever amount that you have. If today you can set aside like $100 for a month to plan for retirement, you set aside $100. But the key is having that discipline to set aside a fixed amount of money on a monthly basis to reach that goal. And actually in your survey, you already see that people are setting aside money every month, right? So what you're saying is you should try to squeeze more out of it. Well, again, it's, it's up to you, <laughs> Up to right? you, yes, yes. Up yes. to your I'm not individual. saying anything. Right? I just lead this research and I find very interesting insights. Yes, yes. yes. It's, it's up to your individual circumstances. Again, when we talk about um savings, right? I think there's a savings culture in Singapore. At a median level, Singaporeans are saving about 1007 a month. But if you look at across the 3,000 people that we surveyed, half of them save up to $3,000. Mm. To me, that is huge. So people it's are saving. It's crazy, you know? Yeah. It's, it is. It's so, the amount so, of money that they're correct, saving aside. Correct. So, so for us to move up the ladder from an everyday consumer to financially free, I, I think we do need to up that savings mm. whenever we can. Review your financial portfolio. Um, you know, save and invest. I'm sure you hear this many times already. But it's also important to have that protection plan, right? Mm. I think mm. to be well equipped and then you will feel comfortable, right? So it's definitely possible to to go up to the next level, but we need to understand that it's not an overnight thing. Of course, thing. it's not overnight, yeah. right? And I want to shout out, if you all want to take a look at the survey, it's quite interesting. And I picked out some points like, yeah, within the survey, right? So based on the question that I asked, right, essentially I'm just trying to understand like how to close the gap from an everyday consumer to become like financially free, not just feel few only, right? Like, <laughs> like you, can, you can immediately do the survey and feel like it, but I think when an individual is trying to evaluate themselves, there's some objective standards and, and there's some numbers right that I would like to just kind of indulge me and let's see let's see where this goes right so I think in your survey the everyday consumer your the age is about 42 the financially free on median is about 45 right so median median yes, right okay median median, uh, median average but different <laughs> one, statistically different okay so the median is about 42 for everyday consumer financially is about 45 so that means they're a little bit older just a few years yeah. right but the big difference comes here right the income of the everyday consumer stands at about 5.6 thousand 
median. And the financially free income is about 9,000. Median income, yeah. And their savings is the interesting part. The everyday consumer on median saves 1.3 thousand a month. The financially free guy saves 4.1 thousand. Actually, the difference between their income and savings, right, is about 4.3 thousand to 4.9 thousand. They are aga the same. That means, in other words, their spending is in the ballpark. It's just a difference of maybe two martel plus two high-end bar or something. <laughs> wow. You know, okay. or something, right? It's just, <laughs> it's just if you don't go out on a weekend for like two weekends or do something, then your quality of life, I would argue objectively, difference between the everyday consumer and the financially free it's not that much difference. Mm. It is just built upon the difference that the income levels are very different. Mm. Which is why they got the ultimate savings that they have is very different. Mm. But their expectation, their median expectation for savings to feel financially free is also in the same ballpark. 550000 and 540000 is aga aga the same. Right, so just trying to understand like, is it just a situation of raising income? That is the main difference across the board between everyday consumer and the financially free. Yeah, I think having more income does give you a little bit more security. Yeah. Of course, I mean, who would not want more income, right? Yeah. So I think it helps to a certain extent, but it's not just about income. If today I earn more, I spend more. My savings is still the same level, mm. right? So it's all about having that good balance between income, savings, expenses and that it goes back to the portfolio again mm. and also that desired the lifestyle or the desired retirement that we want to have right so I think having that vision is important what do we want to do during our retirement what do we expect during our time like do I want to downgrade probably no if I don't yeah. then you probably need a little bit more yeah. or am I able to balance my um, income expenses manage my you know loan steps right because while the income is not very much different or the kind of median amount is not too much difference in terms of of what I need during my retirement but the propensity or the amount of loans or amount of mortgage I have could vary from individuals to individuals yeah, right so yeah. depending on that quantum that could affect my feeling towards financial freedom yeah yeah, yeah. and I think those are fair you know and everybody say that all the time you know it's, yeah. it's and I'm not disputing those ideas right I think they are there it's just very interesting to observe that yeah the main variance in the survey is the income level. Whereas you can hypothesize that the everyday consumer and the financially free within this survey group spends about the same. Mm. You know, that means uh, on some level, if you match that to consider quality of life based on how much you spend, the aga in the ballpark, right? It's just a few drinks different, right? And it affects their bottom line on savings and their time needed to achieve their median savings such that they feel free primarily is different from the income level. At least that's what I observed there. I think it's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. But another thing that in your survey that you've observed, right, is that 77% of people in the financially free feel like they can. They are there already, right? They know what to do. They are clear. Mm. They're very clear of what they want. So maybe the question is, the remaining 23% is accidentally financially free. <laughs> Accidentally. Because 77% say I'm very clear, I know how to do this, I understand this. Then the remaining, the accidentally inside this financially free break. <laughs> I think it doesn't happen by accident. Right? Again, yeah. is that what we are measuring here right, is mm. all about that feeling, that perception. Exactly, exactly. Right? And actually, again, from the survey, right, they actually know that financial freedom is important. Mm. But yet, I think interestingly, around half actually told us that they actually haven't thought about financial, how to even get there. Yeah, and that's the everyday consumer, right? Like based yeah, on the survey, I whether see. Whether it's everyday, yeah, I mean, probably also a little bit more board, across the okay, board, okay, right? Okay. Across the board, um, about half haven't even thought about financial freedom mm. Or don't know how to get there. I mm. mean, sometimes I do, actually, I do find that worrying. Like, because yeah. if you know that it's important, you should be doing something about it. But yeah. there is a proportion, as I said, about half who haven't even thought about it or don't know what to do about it. Mm. Right. So I think ultimately, hence, hence, we also do this survey because we really want to understand what are people doing, how yeah. do they feel, and what kind of financial status that they have. Or right? what are people not doing? What are people not <laughs> doing? Right? So that we can <laughs> potentially you know, help yeah. them, helping them achieve their uh, state of financial freedom, the desired kind of lifestyle that they need during retirement. Okay, okay, fair. I think I agree with you through the survey, which is great, which is great. There are a lot of insights. Check out their survey. I think it provides you a bit more insights like how are other people looking at mm. this? You know, mm. maybe you can form some of your own conclusion. Drop it in the comment section. Let us know. If today I'm a friend, I'm your junior, 30 plus year old, you look at me, wow, Xiang Tang Lian, I also like that, right? So at this point in time, I tell you, hey, maybe, you know, I should start to look at my finances a bit lah because my income is a bit more stable. Things are a bit better. How would you advise me to go about starting 
my planning process. Yeah, you see, it's never too early, mm. right? Never too early to start saving, right? In fact, I think uh, even for my three kids, right? You know, POSB, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I started with that, right? From so start, I, like the squirrel, I'll start the squirrel, with you. Right? <laughs> so it's never too early to start saving. I started saving uh, plan for them like since uh, the day that they were born. So that will be the first step, right? Is we need to understand that it's never too early to start saving. And the quantum that we save is never too little or too much. We mm. can never have too much saving, mm. yeah? Mm. So I think it's important, like, you know, if for someone who has just come out to work, you definitely need to start looking at your financial portfolio because savings alone is not going to be sufficient. If we put our money in the bank. It's a good bank, place to start, but not enough. Yeah, it's a good place to start. It's definitely not enough, right? Because mm. inflation, what is the inflation now? About 5% maybe? If you're going to put yeah. your money in a bank account, it's not going to help you justify or even match the inflation amount. So we need to have our money work hard. Harder, right? Mm. Like squeeze and work. We're really working so hard, yeah. right? But, but, but squeeze us, we must squeeze our money. Squeeze our money, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Make our money work really hard. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I think that's where we need to start. You know, when we once we have first job, you know, we can argue that we have a little bit more independent. Yeah, we have our more, own income, not yeah. relying on our parents to give us mm. allowance, right? I think it's important to have a disciplined approach, right? And to have a commitment to savings and to also have the essential plans, right? Again, depending on your needs. Um, the kind of insurance plans, the kind of investment that suits your personal risk profile. If today you, know, you tell me that, hey, you, you have a high risk profile, right? Then yeah, go for the investment. Right again, it's nothing more wrong, but it needs to be tailored to your individual needs. But mm. um, it's still very important to start planning early, stay disciplined, stick to your savings goal, stick to your savings plan, and also importantly, you need to review your financial portfolio because we change our life state change our priorities change and it's not going to be a one size fit all it's not going to stay the same throughout so it's important to constantly review our plans to ensure that it still aligns with our goals uh, what we want but to be very disciplined as well yeah so in a broad stroke how many percent goes to savings how many percent goes to investment how many percent goes into like financial <laughs> products you know insurance products yeah, you know, again, in, your, in your view I know it depends it depends right yeah. it depends right but I hate the word right it so depends. it depends on what right maybe give us some broad ideas yeah, like broad speak strokes. to your financial advisor yeah, yeah. right I, I'm not a I, I can't I'm, I'm not a qualified financial advisor. Yeah, I'm a yeah, researcher, the, right? I'm a the researcher. Lead researcher on this, okay? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. But you need to save at least about 20, 30, 40%, okay, right? Yeah. right? And, and in the survey, some people say 50%, 50%, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. But so Singapore again, save a lot. Singapore a lot, save a right? lot of money. 50%. But yeah, as yeah. I said, it's never too much savings, right? Mm. You can never have too much savings. Mm. So if you save about 30 to 40%, right? You're, you're spending about probably another 30% because because mm. expenditure is high in Singapore, yeah, right? Everything is just going up. Crazy, plus yes. three kids, right? Oh my God, tuition. <laughs> Um, holidays. <laughs> oh my god, they probably talk away like thirty to forty percent of my expenses. I feel like if we right? start the mommy talk, right? This thing never oh, ends. Just, like, go on, right? <laughs> just go on, and you want to give them a comfortable, yeah. you know, kind of life. So about thirty, forty percent. Thirty, forty percent, right? Okay. Um, to start, right? Yeah. If you have more, you know, bonus comes mm-hmm. in. You save mm-hmm. more, and the rest should go into. I think it's important to have protection plans, as I mm-hmm. said, right? Because if we do not have enough savings today, at least we know that when we get into unexpected situations, dipping into your savings is not the way to go. At least we know that, you know, having a protection plan will give us that confidence that we do have, um, you know, our insurer to hopefully help us pay for our hospitalization bill, you and know, cancer treatment. hopefully not very confident, uh, eh, right? Hopefully not yes, very confident. Yes, they will, right? Better pay, better pay right? Out, right? If, not, if they don't pay, you come on the show, we will blackmail yeah. them. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think that is something that we need to move forward, right? Because exactly. I keep hearing people say, oh, this insurer very good to claim, that insurer very... I'm sorry, claiming is part and parcel. It should be it taken is. as a given. It is. If, if that is still a discussion, then why are we even allowing this insurer to stay around, right? Yeah. So it should be a given we should be talking about like what is the cover rate exactly. you know what, what are we giving you know like what is your approved list of uh, you know, medical partners that you're working with you know that is the right discussion and not Correct. hey this is not very good to claim you yeah. know but work on the street exactly it's like that yeah. right? so I hope to you know together we can kind of elevate that discussion Correct. be more technical about like what to look out for yeah so yeah. it's very important right? I mean coverage right again that premium amount is what you can afford right so do look into the details right in terms of what kind of coverage yes. what kind of um, don't just you know, look at headline care. number right? not headline number yeah, yeah. Always, I mean, oh, 2 million cover 2.5 yeah. million every, every 5 year got another <laughs> it just keeps moving up but can you share with us a little bit like what do you think I should look out for when I evaluate yeah person? I mean obviously as we said right coverage is important right because it needs to at least cover you a significant proportion, right? Because if today your hospitalization bill is like 20 to 30K or even up to 40K, depending 
on the type of, again, touch wood, you know, <laughs> touch glass, the kind of illness that you have, right? The coverage needs to at least, you know, pay off, I feel, at least 50 to 60%, right? So okay. you do not have to dip into your emergency funds. Okay. So coverage is important. Exclusions, you can never exclusions. predict. Yeah. So you need to at least yeah. be aware of the exclusions and the list of um, panels or hospitals that does, is available to yes. you. So you're not in shock of uh, when you unfortunately meet that unexpected event. Uh, what you really want is, you know, to suddenly take out your insurance insurance policy and exactly. it's going to be emotionally very very stressful yeah. so you need to actually understand what your insurance plan cover right so yeah. coverage is important exclusions is important to really understand what provide you in case of such an unfortunate yeah. situation yeah, yeah. Fair, fair fair and i would argue medical insurance is one of the most complex insurance out there this kind of claims one uh, you know yeah. a lot of the others are quite simple the structure is set up in a very simple way but medical insurance the claims like what adriana has shared with us you know has uh, a lot of things to look out for exclusion you know medical partners list all those kind of things please take a look okay thank you thank you for your time lovely thank you, lovely. Thank you for I having hope me you today enjoyed it yourself i did it yeah. was really lovely talking to you Great. put in the fun. comment section yeah let us know like what what is financially free to you okay see you next week bye